Hello, everyone. Everyone that is listening here today, it's another English episode in our podcast. And today we have another amazing special guest here, right, Matheus? Yeah, for sure. It's some, someone that we are expecting to talk with us, to talk about this, this amazing technology we're using. So with no uh, furthermore, let's uh, talk it back stop. Let's say that you can introduce yourself, Jacob, please. Can you, can you tell us a little about you, a bit about your story? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, so my name is Jakub Scholz, uh, and I'm from uh, from Prague, from Czech Republic, and I work as an engineer at uh, at Red Hat. And uh, what I really focus on most is uh, working on a project called Streamzy, which is about running Apache Kafka on Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, already before working, uh, before joining Red Hat, I worked in IT in the financial industry and worked with different messaging technologies and uh, with things like Kubernetes. So uh, yeah, in Streamzy and Kafka on Kubernetes, it kind of brings all these things together. Great, great. And I mean, it's just, it's just getting something now that you just mentioned Kubernetes for how long are you just, you know, just playing and swinging around Kubernetes? I think that's quite long. I think I started with Kubernetes when it was version 1.5 or something like that. So now it's already quite some time and uh wow. yeah on, on the first i was really just playing with it and trying it out it seemed interesting so uh later i kind of tried to introduce it into the company i worked for at that time and uh, get it used for some actual projects uh so uh yeah kubernetes is not that old but yeah i think uh yeah. I caught my interest quite early. I don't recall which version we are though, but I think it's one dot higher than 19, right? It's uh, the latest one is now 1.21. Yeah, so it's mm -hmm. Neo Crocodile. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, let's kick let's kick the this off by asking you you know, why Apache Kafka and Kubernetes? And let me, let me just, you know, elaborate a little bit on that. So we as a data engineers, we have been, you know, seeing this urge of platforms as, you know, platform, just services like PaaS and SaaS just coming just pretty broadly on, on data engineering pipelines on, on the data analytics spectrum. And when we think about everything that goes underneath the clouds, we just saw that it's all about based on Kubernetes. So people still think about, okay, I have these resources, I have everything, and usually the engineers are still thinking on VMs, unfortunately, if you think a little bit for that. So because I we have this tendency, at least in Brazil, to think that Kubernetes is related to applications, is stateless applications, even though we know that we have statefuls now that we're gonna talk now. But why do you think that Apache Kafka and Kubernetes makes sense in this overall spectrum of the data engineering analytics um, situation nowadays? Yeah, so I think at the end, stateless applications are always easier to solve on Kubernetes than stateful applications. That's why it started there and that's why they are a bit ahead. And there's still new features basically coming uh, to Kubernetes to make it easier to run stateful applications. Uh, but I think it still makes sense to run something like Kafka on Kubernetes. Uh, I mean, Kafka is not really designed as a cloud native application, but all the applications using it, they are quite often designed as cloud native and they are often great fit for running on Kubernetes. And uh, I think that if you would be running them on Kubernetes, then why not run Kafka on Kubernetes as well? Uh, because uh, then Kafka brokers will be basically closer to the applications using them. So you would have less network boundaries, probably less security to take care of. But also when you run everything on Kubernetes and you know how to work with the Kubernetes resources, with the YAMLs and so on, 
regardless whether you love YAML or hate YAML. Uh, when fast, you know right? it, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> when you once learn it, why should you learn something else to run Kafka? Why not use the same uh, skills and the same uh, and the same knowledge to manage Kafka as well? And then one other thing which I often mention as a reason why I run Kafka on Kubernetes uh, is that uh, I think Kubernetes right now is the best way how to abstract infrastructure and running Kafka on Kubernetes is really the easiest way how to make sure that your Kafka can run on private clouds, on bare metal, on public clouds, wherever you want, it simply runs there because the abstraction on Kubernetes is uh, uh, the best what you can get and you don't need to write any cloud modules to support the current cloud provider and so on. So I think that's another advantage. Yeah, I, I think you, you, you have made some amazing points. So about the abstraction of the infrastructure, it's just, oh my God, totally makes sense for me. And also what you said regardless, uh, regarding the idea of, okay, if you're already deploying your applications on Kubernetes, why not deploying Kafka as well? Because if you just look for the spec on the companies or processes that are using Kafka nowadays, it's just the tendency to use microservices. And I don't see microservices deployed anywhere or in other place rather than Kubernetes. So why not using the same backbone as you described you know, to do all the data pumbling and all, you know, the event streaming processing or the pubs up. So for me, I mean, it makes totally sense. Do you have any comments on that, Matheus? Do you still agree with this as well? No, 100%, because when you see, like, the the changing of of things to go to VMs and see how cumbersome is to make the a cluster, to, to manage this, in the time you have to manage this, we will have to do much things now, a lot of things in, in, in the fastest as possible. So if you have to, every time, create new machines, you have to worry about this, you, you lost a lot of time, what really matters. So Kubernetes comes like, okay, let's do this in, I don't know, 30 seconds to, to a new point, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. 100% it's crazy. crazy. Yeah. yeah, once you start to deal with the manifests, I would say, you know, this manifests, <laughs> on Kubernetes, the ZMOs, I think we are good to go. And why not to leverage this with the other, you know, stacks and applications within your company? So yeah, Jacob, uh, Jacob, but I think it's Jacob, right? You said, you just mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's uh, in Czech, it's pronounced Jakub. Yeah. Uh, but Jacob is completely fine. Yeah. Now. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's pretty much for the same Brazilians. Sometimes you have this, the two names, right? So Mateus and Matthews. But yes. Anyway, so I mean, can you just elaborate a little bit about what Strings is? I mean, in the end of the day, so people just, you know, uh, it's eager to understand. Okay, Kafka and Kubernetes, but it's not vanilla Kafka. So what Strings actually is, and why that's just the, this term. And why this term, if you can explain a little bit about it? Yeah, so so Streams is a project which uh, aims to basically make running Kafka on Kubernetes as easy as possible and as Kubernetes native and possible. So that uh, follows a bit on what I talked about before, that uh, we ideally don't want people to need to remember the exact uh, commands, I don't know, Kafka topics, dash bootstrap server, and so on to, I don't know, manage topics, for example. We ideally want them to be able to use the tooling they they know. So uh, I don't know, kubectl, get uh, Kafka topics to just get the topics uh, and really make it feel like any native Kubernetes APIs and applications. What, what we do in Streamsy is uh, we follow the operator pattern so uh, that's kind of a pattern which today is quite uh, widespread for running, especially stateful and more complex applications on Kubernetes. Uh, it basically, it's called operator pattern because basically we are trying to encode the things which the operators would be, the human operators running the Kafka clusters would be doing when running it manually. 
we are trying to take these and encode these into into the operator controller uh, and have it in the code and basically have it manage the Kafka cluster. And uh, the main advantage of that is uh, that uh, the operator is running the whole time and controlling the Kafka cluster. So it's not just something what installs it and then uh, you have to take care of everything, but it uh, tries to help with upgrades, it tries to help uh, with uh, things like certificate renewals uh, and so on. But also in Streamz, we try to take it a bit step further. And it's not just about operating the Kafka brokers, for example, or Kafka Connect, but we also have operators for managing uh, users or for managing topics or connectors to really kind of make using Kafka more like uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and it also fits the other trends uh, in the industry. So things like GitOps and so on are much easier than you are able to declare everything as a, as a YAML or as a Kubernetes resource and don't need to run some playbooks or some commands to, to do stuff. And uh, to achieve all of this, uh, we have also our own uh, container images for, for Kafka and Zookeeper and, uh, and so on. And then we have some kind of side projects, let's say, in, uh, in Strimzy, uh, like we have our own uh, HTTP bridge. Uh, we have some smaller extensions, like for, for Mirror Maker 2, this uh, policy to make sure that the topics are not renamed when you don't want to. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of features. Uh, everyone who wants to learn more, there's, of course, the Strimzy.io website and... Uh, we have a Twitter channel and uh, and uh, there's a Slack channel where everyone can come and uh, ask for help and uh, yeah we are there. Yeah, and we you will be able uh, you you'll be there mm. to rescue us <laughs> as first comers. <laughs> we we just kind of use mm-hmm. your hours a lot, so thank you so much this, <laughs> for that. And hey, Jacob. Uh, there's something that's uh, even a personal question, and I, I, I think we've been using Strenzy for one year and a half. And after a time, I, I start to think, yeah, how, how, how comes the idea to create a Strenzy? How, how comes, like, when, when the situation say, okay, guys, let's, let's start to create a Strenzy operator because we really need this kind of stuff. How comes this? So, uh... I mean, for a lot of people, when you say Red Hat, that means Linux in the first place, but Red Hat does a lot of different things, right? So we were one of the first companies who joined Google uh, in the Kubernetes project. So uh, we are really committed as Red Hat uh, to Kubernetes. Uh, but Red Hat is also uh, active in the in the messaging space, uh, for example, in the Apache Cupid or Apache ActiveMQ projects and the AMQP messaging protocol. Uh, so it's a lot more than uh, than Linux, and Kafka kind of overlaps into the messaging space uh, as well. We would uh, probably, if you would define it with few words, you would say it's streaming platform or something like that. But at the end, uh, it's uh, relevant to the messaging space as well. So uh, uh, the idea to think about how to run Kafka, uh, which was interesting and is super popular project, of course, and uh, to run it on Kubernetes uh, came together kind of, uh, yeah, it was quite obvious. So we looked around what's available there, but at that time, uh, it was uh, mostly Helm charts or YAML things, which made it quite easy to deploy and get started with Kafka, but didn't really do enough to make sure that you can keep the Kafka cluster running kind of these day two operations and make sure that the Kafka cluster will be still running in several years, uh, which is quite important for something like Kafka, especially when you use it for things like even sourcing and actually store, store the data there. So we quite quickly realized that having the YAMLs or Helm charts would not be enough, and we moved to the to the operators uh, and to the operator pattern. And then 
uh, Streams is of course uh, open source project. Uh, it was started by Red Hat, but then later we decided it would be nice to have uh, some more neutral home for that. Uh, and uh, it's now a project under Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So kind of same foundation where Kubernetes belong. Uh, right now we are at the, at the sandbox level. Uh, but we are part of the CNCF, which is uh, yeah independent foundation. So it's not just a Red Hat project anymore, uh, but it's more than that. <clears throat> wow, I think that that answers <laughs> a little about mm -hmm. how come the idea, which is brilliant. So, um, what are the main advantages that you see, like like people just using not only not Apache, Kafka, Vanilla on Kubernetes, but also just, you know, using strings operator. I think a lot of the advantages comes up from the, from the operator pattern and what I, what I mentioned already before, right? The operator is always running there and does a lot more than uh, just uh, install the things, uh, but it really tries to help you and make sure the things stay running uh, I mean there's always more and more work you can do to improve things uh, but uh, yeah the operator does right now at least some things uh, for you and makes it a lot easier uh, I think compared to a lot of the other ways how you can run Kafka having the ability to manage uh, the things like users and topics uh, is also an advantage. Uh, and uh, yeah, then for a lot of people, it's also attractive that uh, we are open source. We have Apache software license 2.0, so there are no no strings, uh, strings attached. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you compare it more against running something on VMs, for example, then it's everything is much easier because you just use the custom resource which describes the Kafka cluster kind of as a blueprint and the operator takes care of the rest. So you don't need to do any editing of, uh, of config files and copying the config files to the different VMs. That's basically all taken care of. True, true. And, and things that I think Luan and I heard a lot of when we have lives and we have podcasts, are like, okay, we know how it's transient, what is transient at the end of the day, we know the benefits, but in which scenario we see more fitting for, for transient? Can you, can you elaborate for us when you see customers and users using transient in, in daily basis? To be honest, I'm not sure there are any specific scenarios or use cases where Streamzy would be used more or used less. I think like from the issues and from the people coming to the Slack and to the community, I think it covers almost everything. There's a lot of users running it in, uh, in public clouds on the Kubernetes distributions or services uh, from Amazon and Azure and Google but there's a lot of people using it on premise or in private cloud. So it kind of covers all the different infrastructure pieces, but it also covers all the different uh, use cases. There are people using it for stream processing. There are people looking into how to use it uh, uh, on the edge, for example, to kind of use parts of Streamzy on some small uh, clusters running somewhere on the edge at the customers or or things like that on things like Raspberry Pi. Uh, so I think it covers all these things, uh, including the more kind of just delivered data use cases such as delivering logs. Uh, uh, so I, I, to be honest, I don't think there's any specific scenario where I would say that's where most people use Frimzy. Yeah, true. Yes, that makes sense. I, mm. I see. I have seen this everywhere, to be honest. Um, I mean, just not Streamzy, but I mean, just Kafka. And as more as we just jump on customers, as more as we recommend Streamzy uh, for them to deploy, because I mean, it's easy to maintain, easy, you know, to tap, and more uh, specifically, 
upgrades and you know all the stuff it, it sounds much more attractive rather than just doing this through the amps but yeah just extending a little bit about the question that Matheus has Matheus has made so in your personal opinion so why do you think that Kafka is becoming the de facto for microservices communication and free stream processing because we know that we have others around there this ecosystem this this space like you said uh, Kinesis, PubSub, Event Hubs, or even open source um, uh, that, that just kind of, you know, just pretty much shares and overlaps in features as Kafka. But Kafka is just the second most used, um, I would say, open source project in the world today. And also we see for seven out of the 10 companies of the Fortune 100 uses Kafka as the backbone system. So why do you think um, that became so popular? So what is your is your take on that? So first of all, Kafka is a great project and it works uh, really well and it has good quality, right? That's uh, very important. But I also think uh, Kafka had uh, quite good timing. Uh, I think it kind of hit the right moment where the things like the event-driven architectures uh, uh, became much more, much more in and much more uh, popular. Uh, to large extent also kind of uh, moving to them instead of to say, let's do everything over HTTP, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think Kafka really hit exactly this moment and that helped it to become uh, very, very popular because uh, yeah, at the right time, they were the best choice for, for even rune architectures and for stream processing. And so people started to using it uh, and uh, there are a lot of other projects in this space as well, but it's a bit, uh, if you come too late, it's not always enough that you are slightly better. You need to be a lot better to actually attract the interest and kind of steal the people from Kafka. So I think there's a lot of interesting projects around, but yeah, I think so far, none of them really is enough, has enough to offer over Kafka to kind of, uh, attract enough people. But then I also think uh, Confluent uh, as the main company behind Kafka, so to say, they're really good at marketing their blog yes. posts, videos, and so on. They are really amazing and good quality stuff. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think they obviously helped it uh, a lot and uh, at the end, it's one thing what your project can do or cannot do, but being able to actually sell it and being able to kind of introduce it to the users, that's quite important as well. And uh, I sometimes even say that they are they are so good at it that they maybe to some extent even overhyped it <laughs> because you quite often see people who True. have some problem and they try to solve it by using Kafka, even through maybe Kafka isn't really the best solution. So uh, yeah, they they did really great job there. Uh, and uh, that's definitely a big part of why Kafka is so popular uh, as it is. Yeah, that, that's a nice point. And I mean, for, for my next question or point, uh, I would put you in a little bit of, I don't know, of comfort zone. Because for me, I have been asked I have been asked about these questions which is quite often. And I just, I would, I mean, just sincerely, I just want to know what is your opinion on that. So uh, when we start to talk about Kafka and they just kind of, I mean, I think the product sold uh, sells by itself in terms of feature wise and how it's easy to start to ingest data, read data, you know, just do this microservice approach as a, you know, a spine on your system, which makes total sense. But there, there comes a time that the IT is gonna ask you this. Okay, we we are just we know Kafka, we are good to go with Kafka, but now we have to think about deployment. So we have several options out there, as you mentioned. So we have Confluent, HD Inside, Amazon MSK, or we have Streams as well. So what would be your, you know, how, how you would position? 
against uh, just put extremely against the others. So why do you think it makes sense to where and when do you think it, it, it makes sense to offer extremely rather than Confluent or the other you know providers? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, just in, in that in that ecosystem. So I'm just super eager to know your answer on that because that's usually the questions that I have to answer. You know, so it's just yeah, it's gonna be fun. That question is gonna be fun. Yeah, to be honest, I don't think you can say that one thing is better than the other uh, or the other way around. I I don't think I can really say something like uh, Streams is always better than Amazon MSK or, or something like that, right? It always depends a lot on uh, what do you actually want and what works better for you at the end. And each has kind of its own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think the advantage of Streamzy uh, is uh, some of them are quite obvious, right? Because it's Streamzy and runs everywhere where Kubernetes run. You can, for example, run it on-premise or in your private cloud. And that's important from many different aspects. So that's important because maybe that's where your data are. And if you would uh, have the data somewhere in Amazon MSK, but you would be reading them from your, I don't know, machine learning training models running on premise and uh, processing all the data and paying for that to Amazon, uh, that would be quite expensive. So there are a lot of cases where this is really important. Similarly, like, I mean, I worked in the financial industry and there's not that easy to say, okay, I'm going to use someone's managed service because quite often it's confidential data which cannot leave your company. And uh, if they do, then you need to have some agreements and things like that and approvals. So that's definitely one of the big advantages. Then uh, also thanks to Kubernetes, if you decide to move from one provider to another, uh, we make it much easier because do you run Amazon uh, EKS? Do you run Azure AKS? Or do you run Google GKE? Or do you run on-premise? Kubernetes run everywhere. And uh, that makes Streamsy run there as well. So all to the moving of the cluster and the data is not something uh, what's done like this. It's still something what can be done much easier with something like Streamsy, where you don't need to learn the new things. Uh, so you basically get the same tooling and the same know-how and use it, uh, use it everywhere. Yeah. And then uh, I think in many cases we are a bit more configurable than some of the managed things. So you have a bit more freedom, uh, but also you can uh, choose your own uh, responsibility uh, because Streamzy as a as an open source project, you can contribute features, you can uh, modify the code, uh, you can, at the end, if you would not be happy, you can fork it. And uh, so, for example, I have talked with people who were using some of these managed services, but they run into problems that uh, suddenly their application stopped working for them, but the managed service didn't really give them really the level of access that they can figure out what the problem is. But at the same time, the service didn't really help them to solve the problem. And some of them, basically based on that, decided to move to Kubernetes and to operating the Kafka cluster themselves, uh, for example, with Streamzy. Because on one hand, it gives them uh, more work and more responsibility for that. But on the other hand, when they have some problems, it's only up to them to basically decide uh, how important it is, how much effort they are going to invest. And uh, if they really want, thanks to the open source nature of Streamzy, they can basically, to solve the problem, they can disassemble the whole Streamzy project and then assemble it again to figure out uh, where the issue is and how to fix it, which is not always the option for the, for the managed services. Uh, what we actually also see quite often with, uh, with Streamzy is that we have these topic and user operators for managing the, the topics and users. And we didn't really expect it on the beginning, but we have quite a lot of users who, for example, are using Amazon MSK, 
but they use the user and the topic operators to help manage the, the users or the topics in the managed cluster. So to some extent, uh, you can also combine the things together. Uh, similarly, you can use Amazon MSK or Confluent Cloud, but then run connectors inside your Kubernetes cluster with Streamzy. So there are also some options how you can uh, combine all of these together. Yeah, I mean, perfect pitch. Uh, that's, I mean, for us that we have been working with Streamzy, I would say for almost one year and a half. So we had like scenarios that we described where uh, the customer was just asking, for example, okay, uh, without Stringzy, we would like to move these VMs, these Kafka brokers to another, you know, cloud computing. And that was completely overkill. It's just bothersome to make this. And we had scenarios where the customer just simply came to us and said, hey, we're just running on AKS and we're just, we're going to go to GKE. Mm -hmm. So what would be the, you know, the task and what would be the steps to make it? Is this too much to, you know? And it's just about frictionless, right? You can just even do this by me or maker if you don't want to, you know, shut down with yeah. stop for a second. You can just put the mirror maker, just sync the topics and then just shut down the cluster. Or if you have some business on non business hours, you can just rebuild the strings in, I don't know, 15 minutes, whatever. And then you can just synchronize the data, or just can replay the data, and everything's there sitting in another place, completely transparent. The only change that you have to make sometimes is just about the, you know, the endpoint that you're going to tap, the IP, the load balancer IP. And that's something that is just pretty fancy for me in the perspective because I worked uh, with Kafka deployments on VMs, so I know how it's just hard to maintain them, you know, to administer. So, but yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, regarding there's no right and wrong. It's just a matter of understanding your environment, your scope based on the customer need, and then just, you know, offer each one based on that. So if the customer is using Kubernetes for me, it makes totally sense to go uh, towards that offering of Streamzy. And yeah, I, I seen scenarios where customers, they were not too happy with the managed services. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of, you know, just said, okay, I just want to have more control of my environment. So that's why I'm just bringing, you know, this, this, you know, this whole pack into my area. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that we discussed like nice points. And I think that there's a big announcement to come. We have the Skip 500, which has been like a big thing. It's been more than one year that inside of this <laughs> Kip 500, they have another Kips inside. So... The, I mean, I would say that the outcome and the, the target idea is to completely remove Zookeeper from Kafka. And we know, I mean, there's a bunch of blogs out there. I think we have things on strings as well that explains a, a little bit about the duties of Zookeeper and how to interact with Kafka. But in your opinion, what do you think is going to be the main advantages when you, I mean, once you have the version would completely remove with JBODs and all the, you know, features because it's working right now, but it's just more experimental development space. So what do you see is going to be the main advantages to have not only Zookeeper remover, uh, removal, but also strings on top of that? What do you, what do you envision for, for the upcoming releases of strings in that area? So let me start by confirming that, yeah, that's the big thing in the Kafka world, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> as you said, it was announced, I guess, more than a year ago. Yeah. And since it was announced, we have users asking uh, us uh, in the community, so do you already support this Kafka without Zookeeper? And we are like, yeah, it's just something what's being worked on. It's not really something what's part of Kafka. Uh, yet, so, I mean, now with 2.8, it's to some extent present for trying it out. But yeah, that's, that's how you know that it's the big thing when people are asking you if you support it, even through it doesn't really exist yet. Uh, <laughs> and to be honest, I think it would be it would definitely make Kafka better. Uh, it would mean that there would be less resources which it would consume and there would be less uh, configuration and issues around deploying and managing Zookeeper and the operations will be easier. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Uh, it will also make development much easier if you would be able to just deploy single node uh, 
Kafka without any Zuki or without anything and just use it. Uh, and obviously, it will be a big simplification for us. Uh, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, it will all be stable and performant and work fine. I mean, I know that the people working on it uh, are super smart and, uh, and know what they are doing, but obviously, it's uh, quite a big chunk of work. Uh, so, uh, yeah, one has to at the end expect that there will be, it will not be perfect uh, from the beginning and there will be improvements later as well. Uh, in Strimzy, to be honest, but the first thing which it means for us is quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of work. Uh, there are several areas where we are already for some time working on. So since it was announced, there's a lot of work in Kafka on uh, changing the different APIs. And uh, there were things in the past like ACLs or quota management, uh, which were managed directly in Zookeeper. Uh, and now there are new APIs, the admin API for that, and we are kind of with every release, some parts of that uh, are moved from using directly Zookeeper to uh, use uh, the APIs through Kafka to make sure that we are ready. And uh, so that's already happening. It's we are not uh, waiting for the for the final version to be released to start the work. But there's still a lot of work ahead of us to uh, figure out how this will be really configured and how this uh, will be deployed and managed through Strimzy because there still might be different modes uh, how you want to run it. You might have this single node Kafka for some simple development, but if you have some big production Kafka cluster, maybe you would want uh, to have the controller nodes uh, not used for regular topics and regular data to make sure they are stable and available. So there's a lot of things which we need to figure out. And then obviously figuring uh, out the upgrade from the older versions uh, on its own, that will be a lot of work for us as well. So uh, yeah, I think it's great for Kafka. Uh, I'm looking forward to Me not too. having to do anything with Zookeeper. But before we get there, there's uh, still a huge amount of work uh, in front of us. And obviously, there are all the people who hope that uh, one day after the Kafka is released, we will immediately support it. So uh, yeah, at the end, there's yeah. a lot of uh, time pressure around it as well. True, 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 mm -hmm. true. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice point because I think uh, if you look for a second, if you step back, like just take a... 5,000 foot view about, you know, uh, big data products that just kind of implemented their own way to control resources without Zookeeper or without any other platform to do the micromanage uh, of them. It's just pretty big because we don't see that often, right? We don't see that happening often. So usually, for example, if you pick Druid, if you pick other ones, even though they're just extremely petabyte scale, they still use the Zookeeper. But... I mean, Kafka is just, you know, going to a different direction to completely remove that, implementing something on top of the Raft protocol, which became like a standard for distributed transaction and distributed systems, which is pretty nice. Uh, but I still think, as I said, I think it's a, it's a big leap. And with that big leap, it, it's just there's a bunch of undergoing things that has to happen in order to keep that stable and to say, okay, that can go to production is in the same way that we used to have in Zookeeper. So I think, in my personal opinion, it's going to take a while for us to see, like, Kafka in production without Zookeeper because of the features. I mean, uh, it's it's just it's just pretty clear for me that they're going to act in the most important features first, but each feature requires some recoding or some coding, uh, a new coding uh, stuff. And, for example, for JBot, I think we use this a lot in, in Stringzy. I don't see any other way to run Stringzy without JBot. JBot is just marvelous for Stringzy. And for now, for example, we don't support JBot for that current 2.0. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something that I, I, even, I even just, you know, just finger nudged you on Slack because, about, okay, that's because I know that it's not JBot supported. So I'm not going to just even Slack anything because I know that's not supported yet, but... 
just hopefully it's a big thing to come. Mateus, are you excited to see Kafka without Zookeeper deployment? 100% in this because when we, when we, when we see the, the architecture of, of Kafka and we see problems uh, delivered because of this, when you say, okay, let's see, for example, if Kafka loses the controller um, leader, for example, one, and then we have to people to make the election, but it's, it's external component. If it was another broker, for example, it would be much easier to, to work with. So, but I, I think my guess is version 3.0, maybe. They're going to see like the full, uh, the full removal of the keeper. That's my guess, because they were in 2.0, that age, they are testing the nine improvements, and then the, the 3.0, okay, let's, let's throw this away, and there's no need <laughs> for this anymore. So I, that's my that's my thing. Yeah, let's hope to, for you to, to have a, a, like this perfect hunch. I'm just excited to see the three dot of them, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's time for goodies. Um, you know, you don't need to tell us when, Jake. But that's just something. For example, myself, I, I really want to, to know that. If you can share with us some new features or upcoming releases in Streamz, if you have something, there is okay. We have some ideas to put in streams in the becoming versions. Can you tell us about it? So I can definitely talk about the features we plan. Talking about the timing okay. is a bit harder, especially cool. because okay. the whole Zookeeper thing, which we just talked about, uh, <laughs> needs to be done as well. And it's a bit unclear what exactly will it mean, how much work that will be. But so there are several things which we want to look into. Uh, one of them is a bit improved the uh, way we use cruise control and the way it is integrated. So right now mm -hmm. you can really use it to trigger the cluster rebalance and move the partitions and replicas around. But ideally we would want to integrate it a bit tighter and use it also, for example, to change replication factors of topics, which uh, we don't currently support in the, in the topic operator but also have it, for example, better integrated into scale downs and scale ups. So that, for example, when you need, uh, it's not necessarily something you do twice per day to scale the Kafka cluster up and down, but when you need it to have the, the partitions and replicas moved uh, automatically without having to do it manually. So yeah, I think that's quite a lot of work. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a lot of things where we can improve. Uh, another thing uh, which I'm personally quite excited about is I think we will try to have a look at getting rid of the stateful sets. Uh, so right now when we deploy Zookeeper or Kafka, we always use Kubernetes stateful sets to deploy them and that creates the pod. But so we want to have a look at if we can get rid of the stateful set and manage the pods directly. Uh, and that should then also help mm -hmm. us to play a bit more with things like multi-cluster deployments. Uh, uh, so that, for example, you have some Kafka brokers on one Kubernetes cluster, other brokers on different cluster and, and things like that. So I think that's, uh, that's quite exciting, at least for me personally. Uh, and just to be clear, these are really more long-term goals, right? To get there, mm -hmm. that definitely takes many releases and many months of work. It's unfortunately not something what will be in the next release. Uh, uh, something what we also wanted to have a look at, we have, the, we have the connector operator for managing the connectors. And in the, I think it was 020 release, we added this declarative Kafka Connect build where you can declare all the jars or zips with the connectors directly in the Kafka Connect resource. And I think it would be quite cool if you were able to have on the website some catalog for the connectors where you really see the configurations and you can just copy paste them from there, basically. Uh, there's also uh, uh, some things which are kind of coming in Kafka and we want to look at it, the 
the tiered storage, which I think should come with 3.0 as well. That's, I think, interesting feature, and that would be nice to have. And also, uh, uh, I'm also involved a bit with the AMQP uh, technical committees, which are the OASIS organization. And there we worked, uh, or I was really more reviewing and commenting on it. But there's a work on uh, AMQP event streaming specification, which would allow to use the AMQP protocol to uh, access event streaming platforms such as Kafka. So that's now in uh, in public review, and anyone who is uh, interested in that uh, can uh, have a look at it. And then once it's approved, or hopefully even before that, uh, we should implement it into the uh, bridge which we have in Streamzy. Uh, where uh, uh, you should be then able to use it. We already have there some support for, for AMQP bridging, but we want to make sure that it follows this uh, this uh, specification. So that's more kind of the the long term view. Uh, on on the, in the more short term, uh, what to look into for the next release. Uh, the main focus on the next streams release is really to finish the move to the custom resource definitions version one, which will be required for Kubernetes 1.22. So that's really the the main focus there. And uh, I hopefully would like to start work on that fully, or I mean work on the releasing the new release, uh, hopefully next week, uh, and make sure that everyone is ready and is using that uh, uh, before Kubernetes 1.22 are released, obviously. What a set of goodies, <laughs> right, Matheus? <laughs> Impressive. Yeah, yeah, a lot of stuff. Good yeah, stuff. I hopefully mean, hopefully it won't I heard... take too long to implement some of them. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yes, I think, uh, I mean, it's going to be a little bit challenging for you guys internally and strings it to, you know, to be compliant with the Zookeeper removal. I think it's going to be like, Lots of changes that that's going to happen with the operator by per se, and I, I mean I don't have any clue about this, but I know that's going to be you know daunting a little bit. <laughs> Maybe it's going to haunt you a little bit to to get rid of this. But I heard <laughs> like things uh, amazing duties for for this transit project, like the cruise control. It just totally makes sense. But it, you just it spoke. Uh, you just mentioned something that I was. I was I was trying to figure out how to make it. So, like you said, the better integration to scale up and scale down resources. Because, for example, when we have to deal with I don't know a spiked environment or an unpredicted environment, or let's say, for example, that in this weekend you're gonna have like a burst on sales or whatever, and then you have to increase your cluster. So I was thinking, okay, I can just come to Stringzy. I can just you know change the manifest from three to five, and that's it, I'm happy, right? But actually no, because it's not about the scaling now of the pods, the topics are still yeah. attached with that specific stateful set. So what I have to do in order to, you know, just spread this guy, this topic specifically, so I think that's gonna be one of the points that you're gonna guys look into it, right? Yeah, so, to some extent, you can use the cruise control for that already today. So you can really just scale the Kafka cluster, and then you can just manually create the Kafka rebalance resource uh, and let cruise control distribute the, the work across the new node. Uh, but yeah, you still have to do it uh, do it manually. Uh, so yeah, if it Ideally, it would be done automatically, then, uh, yeah, that would make things much easier. And the, the, the other thing that uh, I just, I didn't get a little bit, is about what you said uh, in the matter of removing the stateful sets. What, what actually that means, removing the stateful sets? I mean, when you said this first, say, well, Kafka is not going to have any point to record the messages uh, on the topics, but it's, it's not that, right? So can you just... And briefly so, elaborate a little bit. The way this works is that the Streamsy operator creates the Kubernetes stateful set, and the Kubernetes stateful set creates the pods. 
mm-hmm. and the pods that's where the brokers are running and where the messages are delivered and so on, right? And uh, the stateful set is really just the middleman between uh, Strumzy and uh, Kubernetes to basically tell Kubernetes how many pods should be running, how should they be configured. And uh, there's uh, the stateful sets were great for what they were designed, but sometimes they have some limitations. Uh, for example, they make a bit hard with some things around storage configuration. They make it also quite hard uh, when, uh, yeah, and that's something what Strumzy currently doesn't support, but from time to time someone comes asking for it when you would want to have uh, a kind of asymmetrically configured uh, the different pods. When you would want, uh, I don't know, the first two brokers to be big, the third broker to be a bit smaller or use different storage uh, because maybe you want to schedule their different topics uh, with kind of which are used in a different way and have different characteristics. So that's, for example, another way which you cannot do. And similarly, when you use the stateful set, it will always create all the pods on the same Kubernetes cluster. So, for example, when you would want to have the the brokers distributed across multiple Kubernetes clusters, the stateful set will not be able to do it uh, for us. So the idea is really that instead of using the stateful set to tell Kubernetes how the pods should be created, the operator will create the pods directly. So there will still the brokers will still exist there. It will be just one less Kubernetes resource, and the operator will have to take care of the pods uh, directly without relying on the on the stateful set controller, which is part of uh, Kubernetes. So let's say in a way it's uh, trading uh, trade off between uh, Strumzy doing a lot more work on managing the brokers but also getting a lot more freedom to do some new things which were not possible mm-hmm. before. But at the end, if you look at the cluster with kubectl get pods, you will still see the same pods there for the same brokers. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, wow, yeah, that, that's good explanation. Now, now it makes totally sense for me. It's just going to remove this, the main in the middle, right? just yeah. to make a better deployment and you know, process of stringy. So uh, we are just unfortunately getting to the end. It's just almost one hour of, of podcast. It goes so fast. Uh, but what are the main tips and tricks that you can give for, you know, I would say stringy newcomers uh, to not keep asking like gazillions of same questions. Mm-hmm. It's like, <laughs> what is the path that would recommend for people to take in order to, you know, learn stringy? What is the best way for you? Yeah, so the bit selfish part to start with. Uh, uh, If you can try to go through the docs uh, on the beginning uh, and see what all the options are and what's there, that will make things a bit easier for me. (laughs) Uh, At the end, I try to answer all questions on uh, on Slack and try to always help. But uh, yeah, obviously, if that's something what's easy to find in the docs and I have to then... uh, answer it there, then that costs us time, which we can spend uh, with other contributors on developing new features, like removing Zookeeper. Uh, so that's kind of a bit uh, bit uh, selfish thing, how to make my life slightly easier. It doesn't mean don't ask any questions, but uh, yeah, knowing kind of how the docs look like, at least what kind of docs there are and what's inside uh, might make things a bit easier. Then uh, another thing I would say it's, uh, I would call it uh, mind the gap. Uh, for That's one of the things which is hard when writing an operator for something like Kafka, is that you try to make the different sides of the spectrum happy at the same time. You ideally want this to work fine for a person who starts Minikube on their laptop and wants to start playing with this and maybe start playing with Kafka for the first time. But at the same time, you, of course, we need this thing to be production ready uh, for the production clusters. So there's a big gap between what you get in the basic example in the quick start 
and what you should really have uh, in uh, in the in the production cluster. So yeah, be aware that the example which you get in the quick start, that's not how the production cluster looks like. I we did this video series, make your Kafka cluster production ready, where we try yeah. to get through the different things. I hope I soon get to do some more parts of that, but I hope that's useful for people to kind of understand all the different things they should think about and go through before moving to production. And then, uh, yeah, another thing is uh, storage and networking is, is really important. Think about what storage you have, what storage you want to use, because changing it later, it's quite hard. And uh, maybe the last thing, uh, if possible, update regularly uh, because that makes it easier for uh, us to help people when uh, they don't ask questions about the old versions we already forgot about. It makes the upgrades easier. Uh, you get uh, a lot of bug fixes with Streamzy as well as with Kafka. Uh, but don't just upgrade... Uh, Streamzy upgrade also your Kubernetes cluster because it's always super hard for us to say to make the cut and say okay these Kubernetes versions will not be supported anymore because we usually know that there are still users uh, using them who will basically cut off from the new releases but at the end we don't really have a choice because if you want to support uh, the latest Kubernetes versions you need to make some changes from time to time and you need to remove the support for the older versions. So even for Kubernetes, try to upgrade regularly. It makes uh, our life much easier. True, true. Uh, so I'm just kind of just bringing uh, an extra question. If you if you just have like one or two minutes to answer, do you have it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we, we just did some tests. I mean, we used to run uh, Kafka on VMs with some specific configurations, and then we just flipped into Stringzy, and we just did some tests, and that was like... Uh, the first impression was, oh my god, is this real? Because I was kind of running 200,000 requests per second in like, in three brokers, and each one used to have one, one CP, two CPUs and three gigs of RAM. And I mean, I wouldn't have this, this on VM even close to that. Usually you used to use at least eight or 16 gigs of RAM for each broker on VM to start to play a little bit with Kafka. And when we just, you know, transpose to the strings specifically in Kubernetes, we just saw this different uh, and huge, uh, you know, um, I would say uh, great usage of the resources uh, on Kubernetes because they just no concern raised. So do you have some tests that you have on your mind or something like that you saw, okay, that's a big difference. So we tested this on VMs or we tested this in this scenario. And when we just, you know, just try it out on Z, we got this. Do you guys have some, some ideas? Do you have some ideas of this or that you could comment? Uh, to be honest, this is super hard question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I hate to answer this, <laughs> uh, but I will try. I don't really have any performance tests. And I don't really have any any numbers uh, to give out. It's more general general remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. First of all, to be honest, I don't think Streamzy does that much special. So when you see it uh, work well somewhere, it's probably because the platform and the infrastructure like Kubernetes, but also the hardware is great. And because Kafka is great, uh, when it works badly somewhere, it's because your infrastructure, your Kubernetes and your Sucks. Kafka are super bad. <laughs> great, great. At the end, we don't really modify Kafka. We uh -huh. don't do any code changes there and so on. We really just deploy it, right? And Streamzy mm -hmm. doesn't deploy some custom network plugins into Kubernetes or anything like that. And then it's quite hard to give some give some numbers. Uh, we obviously did different tests and, uh, and have some idea, but it's quite hard because it's very different. What it's not apples to apples, right? You're not, yeah, exactly. Different. And yeah. I, yeah. 
And and the thing is, if you would create exactly the same AWS configuration mm -hmm. with exactly the same worker nodes, exactly the same networking, that's probably something what's quite easy to to compare. But then I, for example, saw that uh, when you try to use the same configuration somewhere on premise, then uh, basically with the same kind of hardware, same same amount of CPU, same amount of memory, sometimes the on-premise infrastructure is really good and gives you similar numbers, but sometimes it's like five times, ten times smaller than in the Amazon, wow. just because there are some networking, uh, I don't want to say issues, but yeah, it's just maybe not as good as uh, with some of the others. And, and I, I don't really want to say that uh, like sure. Amazon infrastructure is much faster than on-premise infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is that uh, when you talk about the performance, you often talk about the things like, okay, I gave the broker so much CPU, so much memory. But it often doesn't mean doesn't mean that much because uh, in every environment, the same amount of CPU and memory will give you very different uh, results. So, yeah, that's that's what makes it hard to talk about the performance because you talk about something and someone tries it and uh, he's disappointed. Yeah. And I got like, your point. Yeah, you said oh, it does you. this, but that's yeah. nowhere near what I can achieve and <laughs> yeah. so on. Yeah, yeah. That has to be tested environment per environment, right? It's just something that has to be yeah. tested and deployed. And yeah, I just... And, just and even of... there, there's a huge difference between running some kind of simple and stupid performance test where, where you just have one producer or a bunch of producers and a bunch of consumers. Yeah. And then it's different when you have different kinds of applications. Some are just streaming the latest data. Some are replaying some data again and again for some analytics uh, tasks and so on. So even that can make a lot of difference. So, so yeah, any any kind of numbers from some synthetic test which doesn't necessarily correspond to your actual use cases can anyway be very different from what you get in reality. Well said, well said. Um, and I mean, just out of curiosity, so you guys uh, inside of Red Hat or any products, do you guys use Stringzy currently on, on some kind of internal deployments or product that you could share or it's just kind of confidential? Uh, I'm not sure. So, I mean, so first of all, Streamzy is the open source project in the community. But in Red Hat, we have a product called AMQ Streams, which basically Red Hat sells subscriptions and support to. Uh, so that's one thing. And then uh, that should not be a secret anymore because this week we had the Red Hat Summit conference. And what was announced there was a development preview of the Red Hat's managed Kafka offering, wow, which uh, is know. based... Uh, uh, so you cannot say that it's just Streamzy because there's a lot more to it than Streamzy, but at the end it's based on Streamzy. And we, of course, have different mm -hmm. internal uses, usages of Kafka as well. Uh, there are different log collection pipelines and some analytics tasks and so on. So, yeah, we use it. Uh, we don't just kind of develop it and... Uh, and uh, give it to users or, or sell support to customers, but we also use it internally. Perfect. Yeah, I'm just I'm just good with all the questions. So I'm gonna leave the last question for you, Matthews, and then we can just make a close up. Okay, let's to the to the last one. I think is is we do these this kind of questions uh, a long time. So, uh, uh, how do you envision? in the next two, three years in continue area. Do you think there are more and more applications we're going to deploy in Kubernetes? It makes sense to, to always try to bring uh, what you see on prem on, on VM, or even in past, being, being inside of Kubernetes, how do you, how do you envision the, in the next two, two, or three day, two or three years? Um, uh, to be honest, I never considered myself a visionary. I'm more the, the <laughs> executioner. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I know, think there will be definitely more and more workloads moving to, to Kubernetes, especially around the stateful applications. You still see a lot of that running, uh, running outside uh, of Kubernetes. So uh, 
I would maybe assume that a lot of that either moves to different managed services uh, or moves onto platforms like Kubernetes where with the things like the operators, it's much easier to run and manage these. Uh, so yeah, I think definitely this, this trend will, uh, this trend will continue. What I think is still a bit missing uh, is, uh, I mean, I work for Red Hat and Red Hat was one of the first ones talking about the hybrid cloud and multi-cloud. But to be honest, at least when I look, for example, at Strimzy, uh, it's more, so far it was more about making sure that the things run everywhere, but it's not really necessarily making it easy to integrate across the different clusters. So uh, yeah, for example, with Streamzy, you can deploy Kafka clusters on different regions, different places, and you can deploy mirror makers uh, to, uh, to mirror the data between them, but it's not kind of nice process. We don't really have any, any tooling where you would just say, okay, deploy this topology and it will deploy uh, everything and link automatically the mm -hmm. clusters. So uh, I hope that that's something uh, what improves in the next uh, two or three years and it makes uh, this whole thing easier to use, uh, uh, really not just in a single place, but really globally. Yes, uh, the tight integration between multi-cloud, we talk a lot of multi-cloud, but we don't, we don't see like like the seamless integration between them yet. Yeah, and I agree. I think that, I mean, that might occur sometime, uh, I mean, the woods. So uh, I think that that's, that's something that it has to happen because in the end of the day, if you have a Kubernetes, it doesn't matter anymore where this Kubernetes is, right? It's just a matter of it's running or not. I mean, yeah. just you can run a GTA, AKS on-prem, all this stuff. So Jacob, uh, what I can say, uh, it was a pleasure for us to have you here. Uh, we are super excited uh, to, you know, uh, to finish the edits and send that to the community. I think the community is gonna love a lot and we're gonna definitely want you on another episode to talk about the removal. How was the hurdles that you guys had on the Springs project to adapt to new Kafka, uh, you know, version, that leap that's gonna happen. So. Thank you so much for having, for, for being here, for, for spending more than one hour with us. I just feel so pleased and, you know, it's stoked to have you here, right, Matthews? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's like uh, we've been talking about streaming, we've been talking in the channel. So for us, again, it's a pleasure. Thank you for, for what you guys are doing. It's very important for us. Uh, and I hope you you be here for us soon enough. Yeah, and I must say that was a dream come true. We when we when we just began the journey with Strings, we said, well, it would be fantastic if you could record with Jacob one day, and that's happening. So <laughs> we're thrilled to have you here, Jacob. Well, thanks for inviting me, and I really enjoyed uh, the discussion. Yeah, good. And so thanks for using Strings, of course. <laughs> yes, and we're gonna <laughs> we try <should. laughs> to you know to broaden this as much as we can for sure. You just you, you have uh, you can have our words on that. So we're just trying to you know to explore these mm -hmm. things in Brazil, and we're gonna try to to leverage the community and all the documentation that we have, which is amazing, amazing uh, documentation. By the way, that we put it out there on the streams.io. So just pretty help me, but. I had to make some questions for you because we just kind of starting <laughs> just putting our feet on Kubernetes, but once we know Kubernetes, it just makes so obvious how it's easy to deploy Stringzy. But yeah, my guest was Jacob. Jacob, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being here. And yeah, I hope to see you soon. Thanks.